Good morning, everyone. Um, it's great to be here. I appreciate a chance to get to, to get to talk with all of you. Um, and I'm looking forward to answering questions. It's always hard in these uh, these formats to talk to myself. <laughs> so, um, uh, um, uh, thank you very much for the the kind introduction. Um, I, I'm going to really talk not so much about ontologies themselves or motivations for doing semantic reasoning or any of those kinds of things, but really talk a bit about COVID-19 itself, um, where we are today. Um, I think personally, we all um, <clears throat> been affected in different ways. I'm, I'm finding myself cooking really delicious meals a lot more often than I used to, which uh, is, is at least for me a good thing. Um, but I'm also missing getting to go to meetings like this and, and seeing all of you in person. Um, and that is difficult. Um, one of the things I want, I, I actually want to talk about two different things. Um, one is um, just a little bit about COVID-19 and the role that it, it's had in exposing structural racism that we're, you know, we're, we're seeing really so clearly in our, our country now. Uh, I'll, talk a little bit about that since I have a soapbox to do so. Um, and then I'll move into talking about the NCATS um, N3C, the National COVID uh, Cohort Consortium, and, um, and how it's actually bringing in data and uh, the role of ontologies and the continued need for um, ontologies in, in N3C. So I, I think we've all seen this that, you know, Structural racism is uh, uh, really something that's come to the, the fore during, during COVID. Um, and it's been pretty uh, shocking, frankly, the impact that COVID-19 has had uh, on, on Black Americans, uh, people of color, uh, Native Americans of, of, of various, uh, in, in various places across the country. And um, I, I won't say anything that, that probably all of you haven't already seen, but I, I wanna highlight a few things in, in the published literature. Um, and it's been, been interesting how, well, some, some of it's interesting how quickly this, is, this has happened um, in the published literature. And some of it, of course, is gonna come out over the months and years um, to come. So this is something back from June 17th, which seems like an inordinately long time ago. Um, and you're really starting to see the, just this enormous disparity um, that, that particularly uh, black Americans are seeing. You know, death rate that's, that's roughly three times that of, of whites. Um, and Latinos are experiencing a doubling from, from um, from non-Latino whites, and and it's these these numbers have uh, not gotten any better. Um, so so again, I think that's a that it's just a really a, a big wake up call, um, and and it's had lots of of different groups that that uh, talk about both COVID-19 and structural racism. This is a publication from the Journal of Law and Biosciences, which I didn't even know existed. Um, and this is a study back from April, looking at the, the correlation between um, basically bad housing, where black folks live in particular, racial polarization, it can be black and Latinos, both primarily in, in St. Louis, and this is St. Louis. Um, and then the, the, the middle tab is really where, uh, where the COVID cases are starting to occur. And again, Keep in mind, this is back in April. Um, so these these number and th this is just it's accelerated and and again it's really swept through these company the, these these communities. Um, and and of course it's no surprise that um, you know in the uh, in things like like um, um, Black Lives Matter and all the different people who have been killed. Um, it, since since uh, since COVID started, that there's really uh, a, more attention being played to this than, than we've ever seen before. 
Um, so, so some of the things, this is uh, the, the, the very far left uh, CDC <laughs> talking about um, health equity considerations and racial and, and ethnic minority groups. And CDC actually has a, a number of factors they point out are really putting underserved populations at risk. Um, and if I had more time, I would actually talk about some of the things that we're planning on doing for RADx uh, for underserved populations. But I, I'm going to just focus on N3C today. Um, and some of those issues, it's discrimination, it's healthcare access, and ability to utilize healthcare. The occupation people have, their education, income, and wealth gaps. And, and inside here, which they don't really call out, is, is in fact, it's things like just access to credit. Um, the, the disparities between whites and blacks with access to care to credit is pretty astounding. Um, and of course, something that's been in the news a lot lately is also then just household income and household wealth. Um, those numbers are astonishingly different as well. And that all creates a, uh, an environment that puts um, black households in particular at, at just excessive risk. And then of course, housing itself. Um, and, and the fact that so many more black and Latino households live in close proximity to each, to each other, they're far more dense. Um, and again, that's, that's tied up with, with, with income and wealth. So said all that, um, I actually do now wanna talk about N3C. Um, and, <clears throat> and it's a little, little uh, uh, what it is doing to help us understand the impact of COVID in our communities. Um, so uh, uh, first gonna, for those of you who aren't familiar with N3C, um, it is a centralized resource for COVID data, primarily coming from all the CTSA sites. Um, and most recently, just this, this week, um, um, a non, CTSA organization of, of uh, a number of different uh, healthcare sites is coming together to commit to, to providing their EHR data also to N3C. Um, and then it's also a partnership across different clinical data networks. And so um, the, the four that have really been, fo been a focus are PCORNET, Odyssey, um, the ACT I2B2 network, Shrine, and Trinetics, um, and that it's actually happened really fast. So um, the, the two PIs for N3C, Chris Shute and, uh, at, at JHU and uh, Melissa Handel at OHSU um, came up with the idea for this just in April, um, and it's really moved a very long ways since the, the, they, they proposed it. So this is a, a poster that is being presented, I believe this week, just um, kind of highlighting um, the, the way that, that N3C is constructed. I'll go a little bit more detail about the work streams and subgroups on the left. Um, and again, just to highlight the, the value for all of the CTSAs, it's really access to large scale COVID-19 data from EHRs across the whole, the whole uh, country. Um, it's a great place to generate pilot data for grant proposals. It's a wonderful place to, to do team science across many different organizations and across your own organization. Um, and then the domain teams, which I'll talk a little bit more about and show you where to go to get those, uh, they're focused on specific clinical problems um, in, in COVID-19. You can, I'll, I'll call it a few of them in case you can't read it on my screen. Um, acute kidney injury being, being a big deal right now, things that, that um, uh, clearly are impacting um, individuals across the country, things like elder impact, emergency services, um, the role of imaging in COVID-19, think about it, immunosuppressed folks and immunocompromised, what are, are, where are they at risk and how, and how do we prevent that? Um, of course, pediatrics is a big deal, particularly with, with MISC-C, the Kawasaki-like disease. Um, and I can go on, but, but, but you get the idea. There's a lot of these domains. And I think something that, that I want to 
call out is is you know if you don't if you see something that's not or whether you don't see something something that's not here that you really want to get involved with please join n3c and and propose it uh, this is community driven so principles for n3c it's really partnership and inclusivity transparency reciprocity accountability and security so again this is an enclave it has data in it that is not easy to release because it's, it's EHR data from, from um, unconsented um, patients across the, the country. Um, so it really does need to have an enclave um, approach to making the data available for research. Um, and some of the things that it's trying to do is, is let us take um, machine learning algorithms and and bring them in and test them and validate them and uh, and see how they really work across multiple institutions data from multiple institutions um, thinking about resource allocation for for COVID-19 drug discovery uh, trying to reduce disease severity and what goes into that and just coordination of all the different things that we're doing across all of our institutions um, from a data perspective, this is really the kind of the pipeline to get data into the analytics platform, the, the data enclave um, that, that uh, NCATS runs. Uh, you can see on the left hand side the, the different uh, common data models that uh, you know, most of the CTSAs, maybe all of them participate in. So ACT, Trinetics, PCORI, the PCORinet, uh, and OMOP um, data models. And that runs through an ingestion engine, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Then it's harmonized into OMOP 5.3. I'll talk a little bit about that. And then that flows into the, the data enclave where it's accessible for analytics. Um, and again, part of N3C is trying to both make that process as open as possible, allow many people to, to uh, interact with it. Um, but at the, and, and at the same time, make sure that it's, it's team science focused and that everyone's activities are recognized and to the extent possible, um, we share credit for all the work that goes on. So looking at this now from a, a data layer standpoint, um, you can see that there, there's, there, there are policy pieces, that's the, the IRBs and the data transfer agreements um, that institutions contributing data go through. From a data user standpoint, that's at the bottom. You register yourself, you put in a data use request for how you're going to go about, uh, the, the, if you will, the, the scientific problem that you want to use the enclave to, to explore. Um, and there's a process for going through that DOR um, request, the, the data use request, and then the approval. Um, and if you want um, uh, limited access data, so that's actually in inside of this, it's the it's the most um, um, secure data. You need to have an IRB approval in place. And depending on your institution and your institution's expectations, you may need an IRB to access the aggregate and the, the safe harbor data as well. So, so there's this, the, this harmonization process that brings it into those different tiers. There's a synthetic um, cohort of data as well that's, that's derived from four of the contributing sites um, that's also available for, uh, for, for people to access. So this is actually an old slide, but it gives you a sense of how many people were involved in getting this going. Um, and you can see it's both organizationally spread out and then also spread out across the different work streams and different activities inside of NPC. Um, I'm not gonna call it all the names, um, but as I go along, I'll try to mention some of, some of the folks that are really involved in, particularly in the, the, the phenotype and data acquisition the data ingestion harmonization, and the a little bit about the collaborative analytics piece. So here are the different work streams. Um, this is the current snapshot, I, I took it yesterday, um, of the, the, the N3C data enclave. You see there's roughly 140,000 patients 
I gave a talk two weeks ago at Duke, um, and at that point, point there were only 90,000 positive patients and 16 sites. So in, in two weeks, we've added five more sites um, and almost 60,000 more patients. So this is gonna continue to grow. Something to draw your attention to is there are a lot of rows of data in there. There's a lot of procedures and a lot of lab results. That's because all the patients that flow in, and if any patient that has been tested for COVID or has symptoms that are in alignment with COVID since February, so all those patients, it's taken two years of data in the past from the EHR for all the folks that have either been positive or tested for COVID. So that's why there are so many drug exposures, lab, lab results, visits, and observations on, on basically a million patients. Um, is, it's a much richer representation of, of their, their clinical experience. And that's, of course, to be able to support some of the science that we, we want to make sure that we can, we can support the questions we want to be able to ask, like what comorbidities are really driving uh, mortality um, in, in COVID-19. So just walking from across the, those, those work streams, um, the phenotype and data acquisition, it's really been Emily Pfaff at UNC that's been driving the work stream. Of course, she's got a lot of people that are part of that. And what she's done is really help define that COVID-19 phenotype, translate it into all four of the common data models, and then have a, what, what she calls the white glove service to make sure that in fact, as new sites come on, that they understand how to be able to pull data um, through and, and deposit them in N3C. Um, and then once that's happened, then the data ingestion harmonization um, work stream takes over and converts it all into OMOP and then starts doing some QA and QC of the data that's flowing in. Chris shoots the, the head of, of uh, that work stream. Um, and, and just to give you a little bit of uh, a taste of, of how this happens, um, there's, the, the, for better or for worse, many sites deposit data in zipped at CSV files. And there's a, manu there's a manifest file that, that uh, is gone through and, and just ver verifying that all the right files are there. Then they're, they're brought into their, whatever that site uses for their, their CDM, um, the common data model, it's brought back into that format. Um, and then there's a number of, of quality checks that are done using the, the Odyssey data quality dashboard. And here you can just get a, a sense for that and a sense for what the dashboard looks like. Um, and there's one of these data quality dashboards that each site gets. So uh, once they've, they've deposited their data. Uh, and then once that part is in place, then there, there is a, an ETL process for taking it from the, the, the common data model for that site and move it into an integrated OMOP uh, representation where all the sites that are put present and they're all harmonized together. So just to go forward a little bit with collaborative analytics, there's actually four different uh, groups in there. There's, there's um, the portals and dashboards, there's tools and resources, there's clinical scenarios, and then there's data analytics. Um, and you can see the, the folks involved in each of those, uh, running each of those um, um, subgroups and, um, Anyway, these are all places where you can go and work um, on, on either doing things like coming up with new portals and dashboards, or from the, the clinical scenario standpoint, that's where they where all those domain teams live. So you can, you can volunteer to work in that space. Um, this just shows you when you go to N3C, um, there's an easy way to log in, and there's another easy way to create an account and request that you want to join. And almost all of you, I suspect, are at institutions where a data use agreement is already in place. So you should be able to go in um, and start using N3C almost immediately. So this is the, uh, the page for um, the clinical domain teams. Um, and I 
unfortunately you can't see the top of that screen because the, the zoom sharing thing is right over it so hopefully you can see the url up there because i can't but here's some of the clinical domain teams and as new domain teams are uh, created they're all posted to this page and it's an open page you do not need to be in the enclave for it so just to give you the urls of how to join um, it's ncats n3c um, there's also the cd2h n3c main portal covid.cd2h.org um, and you're welcome to go there and and uh, learn more about it and and onboard and i'm very happy to take any of your question questions either about n3c uh, or anything else you want to talk about. Thank you.